Let us pray together. Gracious God, as we turn to your word for us, may the Spirit rest upon us. Help us be steadfast in our hearing, in our learning, in our believing, and in our living. Amen. So I've discovered in the 30 plus years that I've been doing this professional Christian gig that every time you read something in scripture, you think, ah, I got something great out of that. Ooh, I've, I've, I've uh, uh, withdrawn all nourishment from that particular Bible passage. Well, that's not true. Um, I was looking at the devotional that Nancy got for us and I was reading the, the passage for today, which is about the Isaiah passage, which I'm going to be reading for you in just a moment. And I thought, oh, that was great. I can't put that in my sermon because we'll be here all afternoon. So uh, to me, it's it, the, the, the joy of scripture is that you can read it one time, get something out of it, put it away, come back years later, read it again, and get something entirely new. It's just like a smorgasbord every time you open it up and read it. So we'll see what we get out of it today. I will be reading two scripture passages today, one from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, and then the gospel passage, Matthew 3, verses 1 through 12. I'll be reading both of these from the New Living Translation. <clears throat> so, this is from Isaiah. Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance or make decisions based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. The earth will shake at the force of his word, and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. He will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. In that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion, and the little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put its hand in the nest of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. In that day, the heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him, and the land where he lives will be a glorious place. And from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. People from Jerusalem, Jerusalem and from all Judea and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. But when John saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to watch him baptize, he denounced them. You brood of snakes, he exclaimed. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe, for we're descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. 
For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not worthy even to be his slave and carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate the wheat from the chaff with his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the chaff with never-ending fire. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. When we first moved to this area, we lived here in Loudoun County. We were on a house on Loyalty Road just outside the village of Leesburg while we looked for a home to move into permanently. The place that we lived did not have a fenced yard, so our dog, who was part German Shepherd, part Golden Retriever, had to stay in the house all the time. And when he was outside, he was attached to a 30-foot lead that you know, gave him some place to be, but mostly he was in the house. And if you've ever had a German Shepherd or a Golden Retriever, you know they shed. Well, one day I noticed all the little dog puppy things that were gathering in the corners on the carpeted steps to the basement, and I thought, I need to get rid of that. So I was vacuuming, and I had the vacuum, the the, the stair attachment out, and I was working hard, and I was working up a sweat, and I felt somebody tap me on the back, and I turned, and I looked, and it was Jacob. And he was talking to me, so I turned off the vacuum cleaner, and I said, what? And he said, who's coming? (laughs) Apparently... I only ever clean when someone's coming to the house. (laughs) Little snot. Anyway, I thought I would share that story instead of another story about cleaning that, uh, but anyway. So we clean up. We clean our homes. We get ready. As a matter of fact, some of you have probably already entered the cleaning phase of Christmas. Uh, If you've gotten your Christmas decorations up already, you probably cleaned before you did that. That seems to be a really good excuse for getting rid of junk in the living room. That's that's what I do. Okay, everybody, here's your stuff. Get rid of it. Uh, Some clean up on New Year's Day. Right after, I remember when I was a kid, my mom would put the Christmas tree, we had a fake Christmas tree. She'd put the Christmas tree up, I think, like the day or within the week after Thanksgiving, and it was down on Christmas Day, or not Christmas Day, New Year's Day, it was gone. I guess about a month of having that tree up and looking at it was enough. Some of you have had the experience of cleaning up a house uh, as, as you're getting ready to show it for it to go on sale. And some of you have had the experience of cleaning up a house once everything's been moved out of it, getting in the corners and cleaning the curtains. The idea with all of that kind of cleaning is we're getting things organized, getting things ready, picking up the dirt and the detritus, getting things in order before a change comes along. In Matthew's gospel, John is getting the people prepared, getting them through a cleaning day of their own for someone who's coming. And the Isaiah passage tells us what that coming is going to look like. So in the Matthew passage, this is John the Baptist's very first appearance. Uh, Matthew 1 and Matthew 2 are the story of the birth of Jesus. Matthew 3, suddenly Jesus is an adult, and we have John the Baptist doing his ministry in the Jordan River. Now, Ma- Matthew's gospel, <clears throat> the entire gospel, was written at a time of military occupation. Uh, it was written from the perspective of a people who were living under the thumb of Rome. And his ministry, John's ministry, was to prepare people for the coming one, 
the one that the prophets had talked about. At the end of the passage in, in Matthew, uh, he talks about wind and fire and separating wheat from chaff. And this is what we would expect of a person uh, coming if we were living in a time that we were under occupation. If, if we lived in a place and a time where the the forces that be, the powers that be, could come and snag us at any time, conscript us into their army because they needed some fresh blood, we would be living in uncertainty, in fear, and probably not a little bit of anger that these people are in our land treating us this way. And so there's kind of this undercurrent as John is doing his ministry of Things just cannot remain this way. Something has to change. And John is saying, it will. And this is how. Now, in, uh, in, in his time, in his day, John began to be seen as the new Elijah. And Matthew, in writing about it, John, saying that he's wearing camel hair clothes with a leather belt around his waist and eating locusts and wild honey, He's making him look like what the prophet Elijah was like. And Elijah was supposed to appear before the Messiah. And so Matthew's saying, look at John. Look what he looks like. Look what he's doing. Look how he's eating. That's Elijah. That's the next Elijah. So the one coming after him is the Messiah, God's anointed. And so this new Elijah, John the Baptist, is at the Jordan River doing his thing, uh, tapped into the rumblings of the people and saying, come get yourself cleaned up before the coming of the one who's going to change everything. And he looks up and he sees the religious leaders coming. Now, some of the versions of this part of Matthew's gospel use different words. Some of them say the religious leaders were coming out to be baptized. They wanted to come participate in what John was doing. The New Living Translation, the Holman Christian Standardized Version, and the Greek, original Greek version of, of this passage have the religious leaders just showing up. They came out to watch, to see what John was doing, to see what the people were doing. I think the difference between those two different ways of understanding what they were doing there comes down to John's reaction to them. He calls them snakes. In some versions, it's you brood of vipers. Kind of reminds you of that Indiana Jones movie, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, when they open the Temple of Souls and they see all those snakes all over the... I know somebody who went to go see that who's deathly afraid of snakes. She, she, she watched it like this. She just... Too many snakes. That's what John's saying. You brood of vipers. Who told you to flee the coming wrath? Uh, Delmer Chilton at uh, Lectionary Lab podcast said, it's as though John is saying to them, you all are just buying fire insurance. You know what's to come, John is saying to them. You are people who are connected to the pulse of the era, and you know more than anyone else how much the people cannot stand what's they're, what they're living through. Revolution and rebellion are on a low boil, and every day the heat turns up. It's possible that John is talking about an agricultural practice of setting uh, stubble fields on fire to prepare them for new planting, and snakes and other little critters would boogie out of the way uh, to, to get away from the fire. So maybe he's, he's using that, uh, that um, agricultural illusion to say, you're like those snakes fleeing a coming fire because somebody is coming to get a field ready for new planting. Because things are changing, guys. Winds are starting to stir. And God is about to do something. 
So what is it that God's about to do? Let's look at Isaiah. Isaiah's prophecy is a clue to what is coming. A new shoot from the stump of Jesse's family tree. Now, if you remember your Sunday school lessons from years ago, Jesse had seven sons. And Jesse was visited by the prophet Samuel because God told the prophet Samuel, go to Jesse. One of his sons is going to be Israel's next king. And so he did. And he went and he saw six of Jesse's sons. There was, a, and, and as each of them went past, the spirit of the Lord said to him, nope. Not that one, no, not that one. So six of them go past, and finally uh, Samuel says to Jesse, is that all your boys? And Jesse says, no, there's one out in the field watching the sheep, and they said, bring him in. Brought him in, David, the beloved. And you can read all about David in 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. He was the golden child. He was the king of kings. He was the ideal. By the time that Isaiah was called as a prophet, David had been gone for a very long time. And the kingdom that he had left had gone through a civil war and had split into north and south. Israel in the north, Judah in the south. And neither kingdom, try as they might, could match the global glory that David and his son Solomon brought to the people of Israel. But there was always hope that somebody would come along out of his line and bring that back. The hope was for a time when there would no longer be warfare in the nation. Something that the people had experienced for generations because of David's sin. They hoped for a time when Israel would no longer be trampled on by larger kingdoms, when Israel as a kingdom would be a place of peace. And to illustrate that, Isaiah uses images from nature. Prey animals and predator animals lying down in a field together. You don't usually see that in nature because letting one's guard down while a predator is nearby is a highly foolish thing to do for a prey animal. That's why they have such big ears. That's why they're so jittery. So a prey animal lying down in the presence of a predator animal is expressing extreme vulnerability. And a predator lying down just means it's not interested in the chase. It's tired. A prey animal lying down means it feels safe. It feels protected. There's nothing to worry about. A predator animal lying down means it's full. It doesn't need to engage in a chase or a pursuit or a kill because it doesn't need to. It doesn't want to. Isaiah is saying by looking at prey and predator animals lying together in a field that the natural order of the world has been so transformed that the usual is no longer in play. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. What do we know about the Lord? What do we know about the Lord? What do you know about the Lord? Do you know the Lord as just? What about merciful? What about full of joy? Full of love, light, peace. Now, the kind of peace that Isaiah is showing in this particular prophecy and the kind of peace that John says the anointed one is bringing is a sense of inner rest, of well-being, of harmony. 
for the individual. It's that way you feel right before you fall asleep, completely relaxed and willing to let everything go because you're safe. Peace also means to join, to tie together into a whole. And it may be that in order for that kind of peace and interpersonal peace to happen, we may need to get rid of some things up to and including our understanding of our own inner selves. What might it take for us to allow the kind of vulnerability of being a prey animal lying down in front of a predator? Or if we tend toward the more aggressive type of personality, what might it take for us to be predators uninterested in a pursuit? John suggests it's repentance. And repentance is not just a moral shedding of an old skin, but a continual need to seek out the best path forward, which sometimes means turning aside or even turning all the way around. Repenting means placing, means God is placing events, circumstances, people, life, on the scales of our balance. We always want to be in equilibrium. And sometimes God plops something on one side and turns us. And we discover that's the direction we should have been going. And then we reorient the weight until boom, maybe it happens again and we turn the other way or really a lot and go all the way around. Ooh, that made me dizzy. John is saying to the people, the wind and the fire, that the one coming after him is going to remove husks around our inner self that get in the way, anxiety, self-absorption, apathy, greed, anything that makes us less generous, less just, or less respectful of other people. Alexander Solzhenitsyn said that there is a line between good and evil, but it doesn't run between groups. A good group of people here, an evil group of people here. The line runs right down the middle of each and every person. And so John says to the Pharisees coming out, bear fruit worthy of repentance. He says to the people coming to him, bear fruit worthy of repentance. He says to us, bear fruit worthy of repentance. Show the world your life has been changed by God's mercy. You have a new mind, a new way of seeing. And you're not necessarily always on a brand new path, but maybe you're seeing the path differently. You see the pitfalls that you couldn't see before. You see the resources that you couldn't see before. There's no drifting into this kind of repentant change. It takes effort. And sometimes there's a little bit of pain associated with it. Maybe that husk isn't quite ready to drop off yet and the wind and the fire and things that are blowing past it pull a little bit and it hurts. Think of the sore muscles you have after a cleaning up day. But the hope in all of that is that a person is able to change and respond with God's help and in God's presence. Thanks be to God for the gift of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died and was raised to set us free and give us peace, this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>